Okay, thanks, uh, Daniel and Terry. Daniel, I was expecting you to talk for longer so I could finish arguing with my, my colleagues on the design working group about key points. Um, so uh, I'm going to show uh, a combination of some things which uh, hopefully are not too controversial that we thought should go into the manuscript that comes out of this paper and also some things that we thought were more controversial discussion points. Um, and I've tried to remember to highlight all of the things which might be um, controversial with, by putting the title in red, mainly just to make the point that I don't necessarily believe everything that is put on those slides. It's phrased in a way to try to create discussion. Um, I should also point out that other than the argument I just had with Nancy and Ben, uh, the rest of the working group, uh, the study design working group hasn't actually seen these slides, so any errors are my own. Um, I think I've managed to pull together all of the ideas uh, that the four of us discussed. Um, and we were talking, uh, Nancy, Ben and I were talking yesterday after the, the um, last evening session that the, the topics that we are, that I'm going to present and that we spent time discussing are maybe slightly different than some of the things from last night. And I think there's multiple different purposes of this meeting and there's quite a wide variety of different, uh, people come from a wide variety of viewpoints, I think that's a good thing. Um, I was talking to Daniel about this meeting and he mentioned that there was an original plan to focus exclusively on assigning causality in Mendelian or more clinical genetics cases, but that the organizing group wanted to expand it to include complex disease too. And it became apparent that there's, there's quite a different set of questions in terms of thinking about a research setting versus a clinical setting. And um, most of what I'm going to describe is probably more relevant to research than clinical settings. Um, that's partially because I think study design as a topic is, is kind of more natural to think about in a research study rather than in running a clinical lab. It's also probably reflective of the backgrounds of the people in this group. Um, it's not to say that any of the clinical issues uh, aren't important or, or in fact they may be more important and so hopefully if there are things that, that we missed people will bring them up. Um, and the other caveat is that I think there's going to be discussions all through the day of combining different types of data to try to assign causality. Um, and you might imagine designing a study which includes, say, functional genomics, and obviously designing that study will be, you know, there'll be important aspects to um, making it well-powered to help implicate causality. Um, but for the purpose of this discussion, we focus mainly on the genetic aspects of the study. So if you're going to try to, the, how do you design the study to collect the best genetic data to implicate causality, which then might be assisted by other kinds of data. And also, if anyone wants to interrupt me as I go along, feel free. So um, we kind of broke down issues on study design into three broad topics. So analyses and analytical questions of how you are going to design and carry out your study, the appropriate number and type of samples you might want to include, and uh, the different technologies that are available for doing these kinds of studies. So I'll take each of those in turn. Um, so the, the first point which we thought was important to make is that when designing a study with either with or without the express goal of implicating causality genetically, it's important to use the existing body of knowledge, both for your phenotype and more generally. So this is a, a cumulative fraction of the NHGRI GWAS catalog of hits by uh, odds ratio. So basically from left to right, what fraction of hits have an odds ratio of just over one to two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. And what you can see is that, you know, something that's no surprise, that the vast majority of all of the existing cataloged, typically common allele associations, have odds ratios less than, say, one and a half. Um, and this is, I've, I've filtered this a bit, removing things like the HLA and age-related macular degeneration, which have really huge effects. And in fact, if you continue to look at, say, the 10% that have an odds ratio above 1.6 or 1.7, those are often studies that are a little bit atypical. So there's things like traits where there's perhaps less selection, like the biggest male pattern baldness locus has a really big uh, effect size. Um, there are some diseases which I have never heard of that there's a, a study in 74 Thai cases and 80 Thai controls, and they find a genome-wide significant hit with an odds ratio of like six. And that may well be right. Um, the sample size makes one a little bit suspicious, but it's that that disease is not really this, you know, likely to be the same kind of complex genetic disease that the, most of these things come from. And so my main point is that 
in moving from, say, GWAS to sequencing, obviously the sample sizes are much smaller initially because of, for reasons of cost, but it's probably not a good thing if you start out with your study design by saying, I'm well powered to capture an allele of 1% with a odds ratio of two and a half. Because if you start by postulating an effect which almost certainly doesn't exist in most common complex diseases at least, then you're uh, unlikely to be successful. Um, that's a sort of general point if you think about specific cases. These are four papers from this year on all looking essentially at de, uh, de novo variants in uh, trios with an uh, autism affected proband. And there are three in nature. Mark mentioned them and one in neuron. And the main point I wanted to make here is that if you look at the titles, there are no genes in them. None of these say gene XYZ is implicated via de novo mutations in autism. If you read the abstracts, there are a few genes mentioned, but none of them say confidently that this is an autism gene. They say, we observe so many mutations in this gene and that's unlikely to happen by chance and similar kind of weaselly words. And it, which is not, that's not a criticism. It's, it, all of these papers take the you know, absolutely hard line that they haven't yet implicated um, beyond a shadow of a doubt any gene via this, this route. And um, there's something like a total of a thousand, a thousand families in, this, in these studies and I'm, I'm absolutely certain that as they, these studies get combined and you know, we're doing some similar work in the UK and as the samples grow, that they will implicate specific genes. But if you again decide to start your study by saying I'm going to sequence 100 trios and I will definitely find the causal de novo variant in some of them, um, then you're probably deluding yourself because it's not, there's no good reason to expect that these four groups which have gone before somehow uh, magically didn't find the statistically convincing ev evidence in nearly a thousand samples that you'll find in a hundred. Um, another thing we, we thought about in terms of um, uh, analytical questions is it's worth questioning assumptions in your design. So this is a one thing that I think as people have st started trying to do in term again because sequencing is still relatively expensive is to go back for instance to large uh, complex disease pedigrees which didn't show any easy to interpret linkage in and of themselves, but with sequencing you can try to follow these up. And this is an IBD pedigree that uh, I'm working on along with uh, Adam Levine and Tony Siegel at UCL. And this isn't different families, this is one giant family that these are SIBs including a pair of identical twins and these are the different branches of that family. Um, it's in total something like 800 individuals in this family, 40 of them have IBD. It's um, if any, any sort of Mendelian version of a complex disease might work, we would have thought it was this. And we've kind of thrown the kitchen sink at this. We've looked at the within family linkage peaks. We've sequenced exomes and then whole genomes. And we're in the process of trying to, um, trying to follow up uh, a variety of candidates. But as uh, I think David and others mentioned yesterday, the, it, it's not, you know, the, it seems like, oh, this must be, there's a big Mendelian type gene in here, but it's not necessarily going to be straightforward. And it's important to really think about, can the variant you're looking for exist? And, and one example is if we think about, um, say, a 10% penetrance variant, which in a big family like this, you might say isn't really that much. And indeed, a single 10% 10, 10 penetrance dominant variant couldn't explain this family by itself. But if that variant had even, say, a 1% frequency in the general population, it would only need an R-squared of 0.01 to any SNP in our latest IBD meta-analysis to have definitely been found at genome-wide significance. So there's a relatively narrow, I don't think it's an empty set, but there's a relatively narrow set of possible variants that could be hiding in this family. And before undertaking a study like this, it's worth actually writing down what that set is instead of just saying, well, you know, maybe we'll find something. The first controversial point um, in terms of analyses is one might ask, do we actually care, and this is perhaps more relevant and complex than Mendelian disease, which variant is causal? So if we know the gene through some means, and we know the mode of action, biological action, by which I mean uh, reducing the function of, gene, of the gene increases the risk of disease, do we actually care what variant is responsible? Um, and by way of example, uh, HNF1-alpha is a, um, one of the most common MODI, that is Mendelian diabetes genes, and it was found, I'll quote Ben to himself, uh, in 2010 to have common alleles which, are, um, which provide susceptibility to the um, more complex type of type 2 diabetes. And they state, at some low size such as HNF1-alpha, HMGA2, and KLF14, existing biology coupled with phenotypic and expression data highlighted the named genes as prime candidates for mediating the susceptibility effect. 
And I think one, that, that's a relatively uh, cautious version of the statement that, uh, as Ben said yesterday, I think everyone would be surprised if it turned out that OASL is the causal gene in this region. Um, and in fact, if you know HNF1 alpha is a Mendelian Modi gene and you have some understanding of that the, the Mendelian variants reduce the risk of the gene to cause disease, then perhaps in this case we know everything we need to know about this region, that there is also common alleles which affect um, the same gene. Turning from analyses to samples, um, I think I've, I've mentioned this already and I'll come back to it again. It's a bit of a hobby horse of mine that sample size in sequencing is still king. It's, if anything, more important than it was in GWAS because the types of variants that we're pursuing require even larger samples. And this is a figure adapted from uh, a paper of Gonzalo's actually from last year. And essentially it's saying, imagine you have a fixed total sequence depth and you want to do a study aimed at finding a 1% allele with an odds ratio of say between 1.5 and 2. So something that might have been missed by GWAS, it might well exist, there's a few examples in the literature. And you could take that fixed sequencing depth and either do really deep genomes on say 400 individuals uh, or really, really sparse genomes on 3,000 individuals. So if you look at this, each line which corresponds to a fixed sample size but adding more and more sequence, the, the lines do increase, as in if you add more sequence, your power does go up, but it's nothing compared to the difference between focusing your sequencing depth on a relatively small number of samples uh, versus doing a relatively uh, less deep sequencing on a larger number of samples. Now, of course, the caveat for this is that it's, we're talking about a very specific class of variant, that is shared variation that's common enough that you will see it and using the sort of low coverage genotyping plus imputation, you get relatively good genotypes. If you want to find very rare private things, this design will, of course, not work at all. Um, but the main point is that if you decide, well, I'm going to f pick my absolute best 400 cases and sequence the hell out of them, for these kinds of things, you're still going to have no power. Um, I'm quoting everybody else in the room's papers today. Uh, I, we think that larger sample sizes in Mendelian sequencing are, are also useful, and that's, I guess, kind of an obvious statement, um, but there's a couple of reasons that I'll come to why that might be. Um, this is one of the first versions of using exomes to do Mendelian gene mapping from Jay's lab, and I think, by and large, the approach is still quite similar. You essentially take all of the, the types of variants, say non-synonymous uh, SNPs, that might explain your phenotype, you pass them through a bunch of filters related to their frequency in general populations, their predicted function, and so forth. And if you're lucky enough to have uh, several different families, you can narrow in on the relevant gene. Um, there's, I think, a couple of points here, which is that obviously, if you can um, increase the um, if you increase the number of families that you have for any particular disease, that's obviously going to provide an extremely useful um, genetic, in increase in the genetic power in addition to, say, any of this um, information from the functional side. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Um, I've mentioned power several times. I'm uh, sort of, it's, as I said, something that I'm slightly obsessed with. And I think that it, it's just worth thinking about um, this was, this was a, a sort of approximation for the, you know, the expectation of a, of a typical single marker association test, so your power, is proportional to only a few things, and it's worth thinking about each one of those things every time you design a study. So one is n, the total sample size you have, and that's um, one, in some cases sort of an easy thing to increase. In other cases, if the disease is very rare, it's a very difficult thing to increase. This, this gamma is your, um, your relative risk, the size of the effect that you expect to find, and that goes back to my earlier point about use the existing body of knowledge to, to ask yourself a realistic and honest question about how big the effect you think might be. Um, P, the frequency of the allele, and again, this get, I mentioned it before, but what is the kind of allele you're looking for? And um, if you say, oh, well, I'd be well-powered to find a 1% allele of this effect, but then it turns out that if the allele really were at 1%, which we think of as being relatively low frequency, but in a huge, you know, in, in Joel's latest height GWAS with 200,000 people, think even things at 1% that are really badly tagged, generally speaking, if they have an effect that's reasonably moderate, they'll still be seen. And R squared, which is, you know, however, wh whatever technology you're using, how well does it capture the variant that's causal? And all of these things are still true. All of these factors are still, of course, critically important in um, doing sequence-based designs, but there are other factors like um, 
if you look in the literature, there's literally now hundreds of papers talking about statistical tests for um, rare variant association, and I'm, I think we'll probably hear more from those shortly. Um, this is, I think, a kind of cool figure in PLOS Genetics, um, either this year or last year, and they basically did a variety of different assumptions of underlying models expressed in these different uh, boxes, and they tested several of the more common um, uh, published statistical association methods, and the, the kind of points I'd like to take home from this is that if you look in any of these bins, which correspond to different potential models of, of underlying risk, the power goes from zero to essentially 100%, depending on the assumptions. And if you consider any of these models, they go from having, they basically are not in the same order in, under the different assumptions. One, one test is better than another, depending on the exact underlying truth. Which is to say that um, if you go through the, the points I just mentioned about thinking about what is the plausible set of um, uh, effect sizes, the plausible, plausible set of frequencies, the plausible ratio of true causal alleles to um, hitchhiking, rare, neutral things, then um, it's almost impossible right now to basically say what is the best powered test to do. And so it really leaves us with something of a conundrum to say um, how, can we, how can we go about designing our study to have the best chance of success. And the point I was making about uh, Mendelian sequencing studies that if you consider a single family, I, I sort of mentioned that that might not be well powered to actually detect the underlying causal allele, but it also has the problem that it's very difficult to make a meaningful negative statement. And again, this is focusing more in a research context. Obviously, if you're presented with one family in a clinical setting, you have to sequence that family and sort of uh, go through the extremely laborious process that Heidi described to try to understand something for that family. But if you can zoom out and look at, say, 20 families with the same disease together, then if you don't find anything, you can at least make some statements about the underlying architecture of that disease, namely that there are, you know, it's perhaps not coding variation if you've been sequencing exomes, or that there are many different genes such that only 20 families aren't enough. And when you zoom out, of course, you can see that what looks like a mess at first starts to make more sense if you can put more of the pieces of the picture together. So, Finally, technologies. Um, we thought of a, a couple of what we think of as technological holes, that is, studies that we'd really like to do, but it's not really feasible given technologies that are available today. So for instance, it's still pretty difficult to use next-gen tech to sequence, say, one gene or just a couple in thousands of individuals. And um, things are changing in the sense that if you look at targeted sequencing, the actual cost of running the sequencing machines is like a rounding error in the total cost of the experiment. And for a while it was the, say, the capture array and uh, targeting just the section of the genome, whether it be the exome or, say, uh, some candidate genes. Um, those are becoming cheaper by ways of multiplexing that step of the process. And now we're getting to the point where essentially, if you want to look at this in, say, thousands or even tens of thousands of individuals, just making the DNA libraries is essentially the entire cost of the experiment and all of the, of doing the, the capture even and the sequencing is, is more or less free. And that's a real problem because for many of these things, to get to the statistical level that you'd really want to, as Mark said yesterday, that is absolutely essential, um, it's impossible to do sequencing on, you know, you, you know the gene that you want to look at, but on the sample size that you need. And another is, um, I'll mention an example of this in a moment, but there are times still, I mean, genotyping still has a variety of advantages over sequencing. It's sort of faster still. It's the analysis requires less uh, computational time. And, but sequencing prior, often prioritizes large numbers of variants that you want to follow up in your huge uh, cohort. And, and ideally, we'd like to be able to genotype say between 10,000 and a million variants really, really cheaply so that they can be done in a million samples. And again, this is belying my bias towards complex rather than Mendelian disease, but there are plenty of uh, situations when being able to take um, a sort of round of uh, variants that could possibly be po causal from a sequencing experiment and to really dissect them to implicate specific variation, you need to move up to huge sample sizes that can only be done if you get a a very uh, cost-effective design. Um, and just by way of uh, one example, Mark mentioned our IBD immunochip ex experiment, which is a sort of version of that. We had this uh, immunochip with 200,000 SNPs. We did it on something on the order of 70,000 samples in IBD. And in terms of being able to implicate causality, it, it 
greatly lengthened the list of IBD loci. You might say, well, okay, but that's not necessarily telling you which genes are involved. But one thing that I think is, and there's also, you might say, well, most of those loci admittedly have an odds ratio of like 1.03 or something, so they don't tell you much about prediction of disease. But one thing that I think is cool is if we do some network analyses, uh, this one happens to be with Grail, a text mining tool from Mark's group. Um, so our previous network had uh, these light blue circles, so there was quite a bit of connection from the previously identified loci. And these dark blue circles are, uh, or sorry, the uh, gold circles are new genes that add to the network. So that's again, maybe not that surprising. We find um, uh, many new loci and we can use the network and, and suck in genes from those new loci, so that's reassuring. But the kind of cool thing is these dark blue um, circles, which are genes in loci that we already knew were associated to IBD, but didn't previously connect to the network. So they were, we sort of had loci that we had no idea what gene might be involved. And it's only by adding the new stuff that we kind of expand the network and now start adding these other things. So that instantly prioritizes those genes as being at least candidates for being the causal functional unit in that locus. They, some of these are cer almost certainly not, not right, but they prioritize them as candidates, and we couldn't have done that without having that long list of tiny effects. It's the, it's the sum of the knowledge that allows us to better interpret the likely underlying functional units in individual pieces. Um, and my last um, controversial point is that perhaps exomes are already obsolete in that I just talked about the, the ratio of costs changing relatively quickly, and um, obviously the publication of ENCODE um, just last week has you know, underlined a point I think that everyone already knew, which is of course that coding variation is only one part of the, of the wider story. And of course this is especially true in complex disease, but I would argue likely true in many Mendelian diseases. And it's just that exomes are a place we can look where there is a, um, a sort of process that is already defined in trying to interpret the data. And that's fine, but perhaps it's time to move on to looking at the entire genome. So uh, I'll finish there and again apologize for any inaccuracies that were mine alone, not the working groups. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, other comments from the working group on all those inaccuracies? <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. So we have uh, a little over half an hour for discussion. I know it's, it's early in the morning, but, um, but I think we do want to study design obviously being a critical issue. So comments. I'll, I'll just make one. I noticed that you, you raised the question, uh, does it really matter if we know the causative variant if we are confident of the gene and we've tagged the gene somehow? Uh, but you follow that with uh, plus if we already know what the mechanism, what the perturbation, what the pathophysiologic perturbation is. So for many of these genes, we don't until we find those causative variants. So. It would be nice if we were in that circumstance, but often, often, more often than not, I would guess we don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's certainly true. And I guess that was the discussion we had, is that you might imagine that, you know, there's causality at the functional unit, whether it's a gene or something else, then the biological mechanism, which, as you say, is, you know, frequently not clear, and then at the actual sort of variation level that, you know, this specific variant does this, which then causes the, the downstream chain. And, I, you know, I, I, I'm not even sure I, I agree with the statement I made, but um, uh, certainly I would say that if you don't have a sense of, the, per, of the, the functional perturbation and that connection to disease risk, then you're probably not there yet. Well, also, I mean, it's not just the risk. It's what are we going to do about it. That's what we need that. Yes, and, and of course, even for, so certainly, for example, for evolutionary studies, um, it can be very important to know the causal variants. There's, you know, the, the causal variant. I guess the context was more in the situation where you've got, you know, three or four polymorphisms physically close together in near perfect linkage disequilibrium, all of which are very strong cis QTLs for uh, the nearby gene, which is a candidate from Mendelian subtypes and you know the directionality, how much more are you going to go get by knowing which of those three in near perfect LD is actually causal, unless, you know, and perhaps all of them are. And so, so 
given how much discovery work has to be done to get to, for example, the kind of network Jeff showed for IBD, um, you, you have to weigh the cost of going after absolute causality against the investment in getting more, more genes into those networks so that we actually understand more of the contributing biology, illuminate the contributing biology when you know there are going to be many, many contributing factors. And so it is, it's definitely a difference between the more Mendelian and the complex where you have so many um, genes contributing to those networks. Um, I think Jeff did a, a great job of covering particularly study design in the, in the complex disease space, but I was wondering, it would be good, I think, to get someone to comment on the Mendelian study design aspects. So I was wondering if maybe, maybe David Goldstein or someone else here could, could talk through some of the key issues that, that we need, really need to consider that are specific to the Mendelian space. Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot, David. If anyone, if anyone else wants to step in at that stage, that's absolutely fine. Cool. Um, I, well, I, I guess um, I, mean, I guess I sort of agree with Jeff that a lot of the same considerations apply. Um, I mean, I see it kind of on a spectrum. So if the locus heterogeneity is, is low, um, then uh, looking at a relatively small number uh, of cases means that you can see something going on in, in, in the same gene um, ac across those cases, um, even if the number of cases is, uh, is low. And we need to think about exactly how we um, you know, think about filtering the variants, but uh, it's actually um, doesn't look like it's all that sensitive to how you do filtering. And I, I guess I would say that even you know, in the Mendelian or, or complex world, it's sort of the same consideration. Um, you know, what do you think the variants are that might be contributing? So how do you therefore filter? And what is the locus heterogeneity? And, and therefore that determines the, um, the necessary sample size. So I, I actually, I don't know that I view it as, as all that different. I, one, one place where I do think it is different is not when you're looking at multiple individuals that you have decided have the same condition, um, but when you're looking at a single individual and you don't know what's happening, um, there, I would say that by and large, when you're looking at a single individual and you don't know what's happening, what you have to do is use existing knowledge about you know genes that influence that um, kind of a of a condition, and that's a little bit of a separate effort because there, what you have to ask is, um, you know, look at all the mutations in that individual that look interesting. Just for example, de novo mutations, and ask, are they in genes that are already fairly securely connected to the phenotypes that that individual uh, individual presents with? And that can be a difficult clinical judgment, uh, especially for a, a, uh, a research geneticist. Daniel, can I, uh, there was one other point we discussed that I, that I didn't mention, which I think could benefit from, dis from some discussion, and this has been raised before in meetings and things, which is, what is the actual success rate at, given a set of Mendelian, in, uh, individual with suspected Mendelian disease, or a, you know, a handful of them, the success rate of if you exome sequence them, that then you confidently find the mutation. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's just a kind of classic issue of publication bias that obviously the failures don't get published, or if they do get published without as much fanfare as the successes. So I was wondering if people could comment on that. So, so you, you see numbers like 30% and 50% bandied around, and I, I think those are probably not too far off the mark, but I think the, the problem there is that a lot of those failures can be chalked up to, I mean, kind of poor study design, right? I mean, in, inadequate power, uh, assumptions about heterogeneity being wrong and things like that. So um, it, it's really hard to say, right? But that kind of gets to a broader point, which I think is what you're saying. Um, uh, so, I, I, you know, so thinking about our dis, you know, s somewhat negative discussion yesterday about the history of genetics and all the false positives, it, that, so in Mendelian specifically, most of the, quote, false positives tend to be the misassignment of variants as causal, right? Not necessarily the misassignment of, of genes. By and large, most of these things from 30 years back where they found something and didn't, you know, weren't thinking about the stats or whatever, those findings have nonetheless held up for the most part, right? Just because the genetics are simpler. Um, but there's a tendency now, as we're moving to exome and genome, people still are, are, are not very careful and in, in people don't do power calculations or anything like that. And they, they just sequence what they have because that's what they have, right? So I do think, I mean, it, it would be reasonable to, to propose that, you know, there be more thought about study design, including what you were saying about 
if you have the ability to do so because there are enough samples and there won't always be um, to design things in such a way that you can make a negative statement about your assumptions and you know state your assumptions do your sequencing and then state your positive or negative result It'd be nice to have more studies like that David I think I, I was just gonna say I think I mean a lot of the the old things hold up because we I, I actually would say we we knew how to do the statistics back then and we don't know how to do it now because in, I mean in reality um, you know it used to be the case that the way it worked by and large is like you have a family and you have significant genome wide linkage and and so you say look it's it's definitive there is something happening in a genomic region and then you look for a mutation that makes sense that part of it you're absolutely right sometimes you look for a mutation that makes sense and it makes sense to you but you got it wrong but at least you're gra grounded by the fact that there's linkage there um, right now in the literature the way it's happened is that we have thrown that step away so now you don't need to have genome-wide linkage in a family. All you need to have is a stop mutation. I mean, the one thing that I find really offensive, um, you know, you look at, at a family, there's a few affected, and wow, there's a stop mutation. I mean, that's what we're doing right now. So I, so I would actually say the problem that we are facing is that we've thrown away the grounding that we used to have that gave us all of these secure genes, and we need to establish a new grounding. Yeah, I, think, I think also, like, if you, it's hard to say what is the success rate because you have to think of the initial study design. So there's probably a much different success rate from when you have large families to if you're just grabbing a single individual from a family and you have absolutely no information. So with the families, um, you, you probably have a much higher success rate. And I think maybe we're a little, um, also we're, we're thinking um, because in the earlier studies, people were looking at exonic regions, so maybe we're also putting a little bit too much credence that most of the variants are going to be falling in the exon exonic regions because we also had that bias before uh, when we were studying using um, the linkage approach and then looking at candidate genes within a region. You want me to talk, and maybe that's a message. Um, so Mark, <laughs> and then David. So, so I think David makes a really excellent point. I agree totally that that part of you know our one of our challenges is that there has been backsliding from what were traditionally very strict standards, and you can even in sort of you know retrospectively apply the way we think about the problem today in the presence of whole genome sequence and reference databases and so forth, and go back and you realize that by requiring a, you know, initially convincing evidence that there's a LOD score of three, we get down to focusing on about 1 percent of the genome. Then we always traditionally required for publication the identification of mutations in independent families. And so if you confine yourselves for, to less than 1 percent of the genome, search for rare variants but require that two of two or two of a very small number of families have a mutation, you now are really in statistically sound territory even the way we can approach the data today on the whole genome level. So I think we should think about that, just as, as David suggests. Um, the other point I wanted to make was it, partly similar to, you know, Suzanne's point. I think the, the idea that there's a success rate in this activity is possibly one of those less than helpful, you know, constructs because, you know, right now we, as many of you guys do, sit down with a large number of clinical colleagues on a routine basis and discuss instances in which these technologies might be applied. I think. There would be little disagreement that when faced with a severe pediatric phenotype um, in multiple offspring of, of a mating, particularly one from a, a more isolated or consanguineous background, we think we have a very, very high chance of success, well in excess of 50 percent, I'd pick it more 80 to 90 percent ultimately if we apply all the genomic tools. At the same time, there are a huge number of extremely severe presentations in an individual case. We may decide that even knowing we have a very low success, chance of success, that there might be environmental causes, infectious causes, you know, cardiovascular events that might have led to the phenotype, that it's still, because the investment is fairly low right now, worth exploring an exome sequencing in that family, even though we don't expect to have success, quote unquote. And I think that the, neither of, you know, none of that is, is necessarily bad study design. It's applying the tools and evaluating in what circumstances it's worth trying to apply the tools, but being realistic about the chance of success. Okay, so, so actually we do, we have David Dimmick, Gonzalo, um, and Jeff Barrett, and Joel. So I, I'm going <clears> to <throat> offer a, a contrary point of view to increasing 
um, the sample size, which is to increase the power. I think one of the mistakes we've made over the last 10 years is we've increased sample size at the cost of not at adequately phenotyping the patients, so we end up having more heterogeneous groups of patients. And I would argue that, that we perhaps should focus more effort on improving the power, the chances of actually finding something by increasing the um, homogeneity of the groups so that we actually have a bigger effect size for variants. And so reducing the problems with um, multiple genes being involved in a less well-defined. And, and I think coming as a, a rare disease researcher, I, I kind of sometimes have the opinion that most common diseases are actually a collection of rare diseases. So I'll, I'll put that bias out on the table. But, but I think one of the ways we can improve study design is actually by improving the power by being more accurate with actually the phenotyping and the collection of the patients in the first place. And it's, it's kind of a converse argument to the increasing the numbers argument. Gonzalo? Yeah, so, um, you know, even though I'm a sample size guy, you know, I always argue for larger sample sizes. I, I do agree that, you know, there, there are many examples where picking the right subphenotype, even for a trait that appears very complex, uh, say like macular degeneration, can lead you, you know, to a finding. No, I think that's all fair as long as you, you know, you use the same criteria for evidence. You don't say, oh, because I picked the, a very interesting subset of patients, now I can use a lower threshold. But I, I you know, I, I think you basically need to try a variety of things. Some of these traits are extremely hard to subclassify. If you think about type 2 diabetes or something like that, it's extremely hard to figure out how to subdivide. You know, I think the other thing is, you know, the history of the field is that, you know, we do know what the really high quality Mendelian disease study is, you know? So if you think about, say, uh, I don't know, what Ed Stone and Val Sheffield used to do, you know, they used to clone a few Mendelian eye disorders every year, and they basically would start with a family, they'd find a, a variant that they say, you know, it probably implicates this gene, and then they'd have a panel of, you know, rare eye disease cases that Ed Stone collected over many years, and they'd say, oh, let's screen that gene in our panel. And typically you'd end up saying, well, we actually found examples of additional mutations and didn't find any in controls, and you'd say, ah, that's pretty convincing. Or you would say, ah, actually, we found there's a bunch of random things in the panel and also in controls, and, you know, you'd give up. But I, I think that, you know, as we say, oh, you know, let's go just with a finding in a single family, let's s skip the step of looking at additional uh, cases or families before we say it's, it's final and definite, then, you know, we lower the bar and we let a bunch of random things slip by. And I guess the nature of the thing is it's much easier to make a mistake than to get the right thing. You know, there's, you have 19,999 chances versus one or something like that. Um, you know, although I think it's true that, you know, the success rate increases if you have a better pedigree and, or you have evidence for inbreeding, you know, Jeff shows us a, a great example for IBD. You know, if most of us probably looking at that pedigree would say, you know, that should be, mappable, you know, th this is hundreds of times higher than the population incidence of IBD. And, you know, so far it's, it's been pretty hard. And I think there's lots of examples like that out there. So I think the, you know, I, th I think the 30 to 50% is probably actually the right ballpark for, but I, I'm not an expert in that field. So. Uh, Jeff? Um, so I wanted to, um, comment on a couple of things that were mentioned in the last few minutes. So one was that I think Mark's point was, was a very good one that, you know, saying, oh, what's the rate of success at, um, at you know, lumping sort of exome Mendelian sequencing into one thing is obviously probably not that helpful. And in fact, it, it might be, one thing that might be useful to come out of this would be to propose a set of different kinds of study designs that actually are, generally speaking, better powered and ways of evaluating whether the particular number and type of families you have is, is a sensible thing to do. Because in some sense, um, it, you know, it, if we could encourage people to, to, to sort of critically think about picking the winners in advance, it probably would improve that success rate. Um, and also would be, it would be maybe useful to, to have a sort of uh, assembled catalog of the different types of designs and whether they tend to actually uh, succeed in identifying a mutation or not, and as Mark said, it doesn't necessarily matter. Doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't do the things that are a bit less likely to work, but just that at least you have a sense going into it of whether of where your proportion of success might lie. 
Um, the other thing, um, I mentioned the, the, this idea of questioning the design assumptions with that, that IBD pedigree of, you know, that it is, is it really a pseudo-Mendelian version of IBD? Um, and another one that I, I think is potentially interesting is in designs such as looking at population isolates or likely consanguineous marriages or things where you have a very clear um, a priori expectation of what the genetic model is, how often are you actually right? So you might, you know, Mark, you said you can, you can often find, uh, you can often find the causal mutation if you go in with, say, a um, family that presents as an extremely likely to be a sort of recessive uh, model. But presumably some fraction of the time, that's just coincidence. And in fact, there's a different model under action. And um, I think it's useful to try to, to have an idea of, given different, those different assumptions, those different designs, how often does it actually turn out to be what you expect it to be versus something else? So we have Joel next. Yeah, so I think in terms of <clears throat> judging from the, you know, what's happened and what's been successful, uh, there's some good lessons to be drawn and then some maybe dangerous lessons as well. So the good lessons are if you can try to figure out, you know, what, what characteristics of the families or clinical phenotypes uh, led to success, that can be, I think, very helpful. But one uh, example from the parallel history of association studies, the initial associations were gonna, that were discovered were, of course, the easiest ones to find. So things like HLA and even APOE and things like that. And many study designs were based on the idea that they were going to find the HLA for type 2 diabetes and that sort of thing. And of course, for some diseases that worked very well, and for other diseases there was nothing like that um, to be found. And I think the same thing is probably happening for Mendelian diseases. Uh, you know, up until now, one of the limitations has been also that, you know, the people with the families which were highly likely for success may not have had access to the technology that they needed to do the gene discovery, but that's really rapidly becoming uh, accessible to everybody. And so what's going to be left are the things that are by definition going to be much harder. And I think that the study design really probably needs to take that into account um, moving forward. Um, so past success may not be, in this case, the best predictor of future success. We may need to work harder. Um, and then uh, in terms of uh, s sample size and study design, again, as Mark said, it, there's potential exploratory value in looking at the one patient where you think, you know, you may not be able to definitively find something, but may you may be able to implicate things. But and hopefully this is a theme that will come up again. There may be somebody else halfway across the world with the same, essentially the same disease in a, in a family. And if neither person looks at that one family, then that discovery will never get made. But if there's some way of both, you know, both groups looking at that same family and knowing about each other, uh, and so some mechanism for making that those results available, um, then that I think will greatly increase the chance of um, maybe very rare diseases where there aren't these, you know, multiple large families uh, having discovery. And then I guess the phenotyping. I think that probably uh, in terms of is it better to increase sample size or uh, uh, be more specific about phenotyping. I think that's actually a very interesting question. It's probably disease and phenotype specific, what the answer is. Um. So, so we did talk last evening about approaches, as Joel had, had mentioned, uh, for sharing this kind of information. And obviously, sharing comes up at, at every meeting that we hold and many, many others. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, is any of the later groups, maybe known variants or experimental data or somebody, um, going to tackle this issue? Because at some point, we really need to. Is this on anybody's? So I, I can throw a comment out there. What you want is not to share the variant. You kind of want to share the, the genome with some annotation. You know, if you, if, if, if Joel ha has a, an interesting case or Mark has an interesting case and they sequence it and they have an hypothesis, they want to say in previous cases that, that ha had similar features or actually in any other case of Mendelian disorders, where did variants in this gene get seen, right? And uh, I also want to, throw out uh, actually a different design, uh, maybe, uh, you know, so one thing that, that's starting to become possible is this idea that, you know, if we want to find out what's the role of rare variants, you know, one way to go about it is to find, you know, a rare disease case and sequence it and figure out, you know, this, we, we think it's probably this variant and, you know, and after you collect a series of such cases, you, you'll have an hypothesis. But, you know, it's also possible now to think about studies where you, you might sequence you know, even hundreds of thousands of people, and then say, I'm interested in the role of rare variants in this gene, particularly so I, I might be able to advise someone where I find a new variant there that I haven't seen before. You know, and there you could actually say, hey, let me pull out all the individuals out of those 
100,000 that happen to carry rare variants in a particular gene and think about bringing them back for some phenotyping. You know, and I think that, you know, for, for many kinds of uh, questions where, you know, we want to say, what does your variant mean long term when you don't have a clear clinical phenotype? You kind of need that kind of perspective thing where you collect the individuals with the mutation and then phenotype them and, and figure out what you can learn about the phenotype. Right, and, and so we have David, actually David Valley, David Goldstein, and, and Mark Daly, but I might just, just, and Heidi, I'm starting to forget. Um, <laughs> David Valley, David Goldstein, um, who was the other? Mark and Heidi. Mark and Heidi, thank you. Um, but it, it, pursuant to your point about, uh, about identifying hundreds of thousands of people who have a, a variant, that, that was the topic of an, an, an HGR workshop earlier this, this summer, and so we are trying to, to do that and, and pursuing it. I think the, the question that was raised was more an issue of, of all of the things we're currently sequencing clinically, can we get those, those data into a database? And, and one of the group. Yeah, and so, so I think one of the things we, we might want to try to tackle today is, is how we might do that. Um, but with that, then we had David Valley. So I just wanted to amplify something that Gonzalo said, uh, uh, the value of a second family. So some instances you may be able to share your variant call files, but there's a second sort of situation where you have found something in a single family and you need to find another family unrelated with a similar phenotype. And uh, very often that family has not been studied at a molecular level, but that, as Mark said, having two families, unrelated families, is a key uh, component of burden of proof. So uh, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics have looked at ways to advertise, you know, I've found, I'm studying this disorder, does anybody in the world have another case of such and such? And I think uh, facilitating that would be very powerful in terms of gene identification for the very rare disorders. Thank you. Um, so, David Goldstein. Uh, actually, a very similar comment to, to what Dave just made, but the, what, what, what I would add to it is that it's striking when you're, when you're sequencing, as we're doing, I think many people are now, when you're sequencing children with undiagnosed genetic conditions and, and the clinical geneticist can't match the child up to anything that they already know about, it's striking um, the um, rate at which, even in small collections, you appear to ha find things going on in the same gene, suggesting that even centralizing a small number of cases that have been sequenced like that would permit internal discovery. And what's happening right now is, is really pretty unacceptable because, you know, at, at Duke we're doing a little bit of sequencing and so then when we do it, if we, if we um, you know, have, see some um, clinical similarities amongst individuals, we can go back and say, are there any genomic similarities? But even, even at Duke, there's lots and lots of sequencing going on where um, a sequence is ordered from Baylor or UCLA, UCLA or wherever. And all that the clinician gets back is uh, something's been found or something's not been found. And so there's no capacity to go back um, and ask what are the genomic similarities amongst patients that you later decide to have phenotypic similarities that you want to interrogate. Uh, you want to say something uh, immediately. I was just going to say that the, the other thing that happens in that equation is that the phenotype that we know is really only part of the phenotype. And so this connection through the genes actually expands and fills out the phenotype, which is a very important uh, component of the growth of knowledge. So that was like the second point I wanted to make to amplify on Gonzalo's point. Um, so if, if you think about what we've done so far in terms of understanding um, the kinds of phenotypes that mutations in a given gene can produce, what's, what's basically happened is that you start by clinical similarity. And so what that means is that you're only looking at individuals where mutation carriers are more similar to one another than they are to wild type. But if you, if you think about what we know from animal models, it, it's very, very frequent that mutations in a given gene um, result in some of the animals being more similar to one another and some of the animals being more similar to wild type than they are to one another. But we've had no systematic capacity to look for, fe for, for those kinds of phenotypes. But we do now if we go genome first and we actually ask, okay, here's a gene we already know about that's connected to the following phenotypes, find the mutations in those genes and then get new phenotypes. And I actually do think that that's going to result in an explosion of varied phenotypes for genes we already know about. Dan we should give Daniel oh, okay. just, just a quick yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, great. Right. I mean, a, a quick point on that front. I totally agree. And one of the, one of the conceptual issues we sometimes run up against, and I suspect other people here run up against in presenting results from XM sequencing back to the initial clinicians, 
is, is uh, the response that that doesn't fit with what we know about the phenotype for that gene. I mean, it, it, it comes up again and again. And it, it is because of that ascertainment bias that David talks about, where there is a sense in which, because there's been such strong clinical ascertainment for sequencing that specific gene, of course we only know about that phenotype for that gene. And I, I mean, there's a, there's a profound conceptual shift that I think will occur, as, as David talks about, in, on that front. And so I think, you know, in that vein, I think, you know, perhaps what we need is to, to think about different ways of data sharing, not so much simply everybody depositing genotypes or depositing a clinical report of what are the rare variants, but how to form, you know, interactive networks between, you know, clinical sites working on, you know, similar severe rare disorders so that we can go back and forth between the genome and back to the phenotype of those individual patients and often then, you know, engage in, in collecting whatever additional biospecimens are necessary. Because I agree, you know, completely. I think our view of many, many genes is skewed towards a, because we looked at this in this particular phenotype, we have this idea that there's a very direct relationship between the precise presentation, and I think that's far less the case. I mean, in perhaps some arenas, as, as David suggested, this might be the case. I think we learn more and more about many different areas in which it's absolutely clearly not the case, and so the mutations that we find in autism sequencing, so the large recurrent CNVs, we find those in patients throughout the spectrum all different cognitive abilities, all different affectednesses, and even unaffected individuals as well. And you know, if we make the presumption or continue to make the presumption that we know in advance what that presentation is going to look like for this gene, then I think we're going to consistently be mistaken. And, and that was, oh, sorry, it was so, so I just wanted to comment, one of my concerns as uh, clinical sequencing is now much more accessible to patients is that there'll be more of a movement for a lot of these Mendelian cases to go directly to clinical sequencing, only analyzed by clinical labs that aren't really focused on discovery and looking at novel etiologies, uh, and then they're going to get a negative result, and that case stops there. Um, and, and that those cases, which are already sequenced with a data set sitting in some clinical labs, you know, hard disk, aren't going to be accessible. And one of the things we put into a recent grant was the proposal to work with all the clinical labs doing exome and genome sequencing to um, co-consent their patients for depositing those sequences into either dbGaP or, or some accessible place, and also put in a contract with Patient Crossroads, which is a, um, a group that creates patient registries so that we can collect phenotypic information from the physicians submitting those cases and actually even allow a portal for the patients to put in clinical information, which, you know, there's studies on the accuracy of that information, but I think more data coming out that the patients actually do contribute beneficially to the phenotyping process. And then enable an, a portal for researchers to search through that registry to find, you know, similar phenotypes and, and then know that these cases have a genome or an exome sitting with it that is accessible and enable a researcher to be able to go and collect out, you know, a given set of, of phenotypes, whether they're similar or, you know, variable. And so we're hoping, you know, that, that we might have funding to be able to create that resource, but, but if in some way, shape, or form that resource could be created so that we don't lose an incredible opportunity for all these patients that are going to be sequenced through clinical efforts but not necessarily fully interpreted in my mind. And so while I, I would entirely accept the idea of the burden of proof of having to have two families, um, and I think that that could be facilitated by all the things that we've talked about, we are talking ultimately about rare diseases that are quite variably phenotyped. Um, and I think about, for example, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy quite a lot, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If you look in the basic science literature at uh, the, the pathways that have been implicated in left ventricular hypertrophy, there are hundreds and hundreds of genes that could potentially lead to a phenotype of left ventricular hypertrophy. And I wonder if we make the burden of proof having to see uh, a gene occur twice in two families and we're not as connected as we're discussing we might be, uh, then those things may not be published or they may not be put in, in the, we need to find a way to put them in a domain so that when there is another family it can be, it can be connected. Um, and so I, I don't want to make the bar too high that we end up leaving things in databases and in clinical labs and other places. And I, I think a, a forum other than maybe the literature perhaps that's structured and where the phenotype is classified in a way that can be searchable uh, could, could bear a significant fruit. 
yeah, that, that, that's an excellent point. I think we actually did talk about that concern that um, researchers will pick up, you know, their 20 families and then maybe if they're lucky, they publish a study, a positive result on one of them and then leave 19 on the table that we don't, nobody else hears about. So it would be really useful for the community to have a way of doing exactly that, like making accessible the study that was successful if so or the negative results that do get released and tag sort of in a useful way, as you sort of suggest, the genes that were discovered, the, or the genes that were sequenced, how well they were captured, what variants were found, what interpretations were made, so that then others can sort of query that resource and maybe actually lead to discoveries because you actually start building a nexus of information. Because again, there, you know, how, how many times could, you know, could we be missing things where there's like mutations that lead to clinical variable phenotyping, like WFS1 is a great example where you've got multiple mutations of the gene that lead to a huge distribution of, of different outcomes. Um, we could just be missing those things because we sort of have a dogmatic prior bias about what phenotypes we're actually investigating. If we expand and sort of in the spirit of doing these ad evidence, we might actually be, be gaining in that way. So I, I think that was one thing practically we, we really thought we should do. Could I just ask a, a quick question here about the, uh, the importance of controlled vocabulary for phenotypes? I mean, Heidi talked about the ability to share phenotypes, and one of the challenges we found in, in looking at the phenotype data, even from, from a single clinic, is there's a, a big difference between one family which might be described as EDMD-like and another family where there's basically an essay on the clinical presentation of, of that particular family. I just wondered, in, in the context of the, the database that we're discussing here, how we might think about coming up with a, a controlled vocabulary that actually allowed you to do formal clustering across phenotype space and look for similar phenotypes? So, um, you know, there's a number of efforts underway, and, and I know of um, Ada Hamash, you know, created OMIM that's working with the Baylor Hopkins sequencing grant has created a system for, and Jay and others can probably talk about this, to better capture phenotypes entered by physicians using the standardized vocabulary from the, the OMIM terms. Um, so I know that that's one um, effort underway to try and capture things in a more standardized way and facilitate an easy way for physicians to enter um, patient information on their on their patients. Um, Peter Robinson in the, in the UK or in Germany, I forget where he's from. Um, yes, thanks. Um, he's developed the HPO, Human Phenotype Ontology, and trying to get um, traction on the use of that um, terminology, and I know Donna and others at NCBI have been trying to match SNOMED codes and, and other things. So there's, I don't think there's right now one system, but but I think there's some movement towards that. There's a, a meeting before ASHG this year all on phenotyping to try and, you know, work on this problem, which is, as we all know, a huge problem. Yes, um, <clears throat> I'll just amplify slightly on uh, uh, what Heidi mentioned in terms of a tool that Ada Hamish and her team has developed, which we call for the Mendelian centers, which we call PhenoDB, and it's designed to make ac entry of data uh, relatively easy. The instructions were less than two minutes once you know your way around it, and it uh, captures a lot of data, including image data, genetic data, um, uh, other kinds of phenotypic data, family history. It uh, can be surveyed, it, it, by, it, it collates the data so that someone who wants to look at phenotypes can see the standard representation over and over again, and you can search it, query it, uh, and uh, we're adding uh, modules to it right now. There's a manuscript uh, submitted describing it. It's freely available from uh, 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 the McCusick Nathan's Institute of Genetic Medicine for anybody who wants to kick the tires, and I can give you a website where you can go look at it want it. Great. We, we probably should wind up this, this discussion, but not quite yet. We, we started a little bit early, so um, so maybe a few more minutes and then we'll, we'll go on. So. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll just make this very brief. Um, in thinking about this sort of um, database and resource, I think one other thing that might be worth thinking about, too, is a way to quantify information. So. Um, it would be really valuable to have not only sort of very granular details, like if a clinician wants to go to a gene and look for families or other research researchers who have families with similar phenotypes. So you can really dig into a specific gene that's cl clearly crucial and would be of great benefit. Um, 
now imagine another researcher who hypothesizes that they want to design a study that's a new, brand new study on a new phenotype that they think is really important and interesting. Um, it would be really great for them to be able to go to this resource and actually ask a really quantitative question to say, has this phenotype been studied? What's the evidence for the model and the question that I have for the hypothesis of phenotype, the mode of action, maybe even a prior bias on the specific genes that I think are implicated? Um, you know, in a very, very powerfully concrete way so that you can actually say, the model that I'm going to write a grant on that I'm going to ask for funding for, um, can, you know, given all the available resources that, that we know about, this model hasn't been tested and so I actually have a, you know, a, a powered strategy to actually go after it. Where, you know, in, in contrast to if, if they do hypothesize that and there is data to actually exclude the model that they're proposing, maybe that's not a, you know, a good investment of resources or maybe they can rephrase their question in a way that actually adds information. You know, in a, another way, you want to like build confidence sets. You know, we're in the game of hypothesis rejection, right, rather than testing. So we want to build an area where we can say these models have been rejected and if we add information we can reject or accept these particular models models and thus narrow down the area by which whether it's a complex, complex disease or Mendelian disease, we can actually make traction to figure out what parts of the genome matter and even moreover what variants matter. So having that kind of resource I think in that context would I, I think be really valuable. Well, and given what we heard last night in the discussion we had about all the false positives out there and how people continue to pursue them even though there's evidence against them, it would be really neat for reviewers or others to be able to query, you know, is there evidence against this or, or how strong is the evidence for it? So. Uh, yes. So uh, that sounds kind of like the um, clinicaltrials.gov database, right, in a way. And, and do we think in general in the room would people be willing to put in negative findings, right? I mean, that's part of the that database is that you have to register studies in advance and that you have to then put in the findings. Is that realistic, do we think? Uh-oh. Blank looks. Does anyone think that's realistic? Sure. I mean, how, how could it not be? I mean, and, and I think, you know, the reality of the, you know, as you know, we've been mentioning, the reality of the single family, se family sequencing is not that you can say it's negative or positive, say we can't yet draw a conclusion based on what we know right now and based on this family alone, but other families will come along, more information about how to interpret the genome will come along, and, you know, success or failure is not a fixed, you know, one-time shot. So we need to have creative ways of making the data available so that further inference can be made, you know, weeks, months, or years later. So, so a clinicaltrials.gov model is an interesting one. I can, I can hear the NLM people in the room going, oh, my God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, but in addition, keep in mind that the, the major impetus to, to that was journals saying we won't publish your clinical trial, and therefore, you remember, many clinical trials are done for drug discovery and drug approval, and so FDA won't accept your data, you know, or, or accept your, your evidence unless, unless it's in clinicaltrials.gov. There, there may be less of a, you know, a carrot here, than, than, uh, but it would be something to think about, I think. Maybe, maybe just one less, last comment, Joel. So just along those lines, um, at Human Molecular Genetics, we've been discussing a forum for publishing kind of that single, you know, just short of burden of proof uh, kind of study, especially if there's supporting uh, evidence that, you know, implicates but not in a way that we, we would say exceeds the burden of proof uh, to sort of highlight that gene for others. Um, so we're still working that out, but that may be one forum that's available. But that would not solve the full exome deposition, although one could imagine requiring the full exome to be made available somewhere um, as part of those sorts of publications. Great. Okay. Uh, why don't we go on to the statistical analysis group, which is uh, Suzanne. If we could maybe change the timer back to 25 minutes. Um, and, uh, and Suzanne, take it.